Do you know? Why is it putting the presenter notes on the other display? Why, do, why is it putting presenter notes or why does it? Why is it? That's backwards. So I gotta change which one is primary? Yeah, you can, you can go into your settings, go into female for preferences. And here's where you show like which display it goes on. Uh, there we go. Or not. <laughs> that didn't get mine to like start setting up my iPhone. Good afternoon, everyone. James Arlen is a man whose career and reputation have been built on a foundation of bold moves, trusted partnerships, and an insane amount of caffeine. <coughs> he also has a great desire to mentor and a freakish talent for remembering every last thing. Mercurial is a co-founder of Hamilton Hackerspace, writer for Liquid Matrix Security Digest, and contributor to Make Magazine. In his spare time, he likes to take things apart and add lights and sounds before putting them back together. Throw them in a blender, hit frappe, and the result is the speaker standing before you. Ladies and gentlemen, James Arlen. Um, you have to excuse me. All of you are absent. The lights are really bright in my face. So welcome to the talk. Glad you could come and join us. Um, we know that you're worried. We'll get to the worried part at the end. And trust me, you don't have to be worried. Uh, my name is James Arlen. I'm a former CISO. I don't do very much CISO work right now because CISO in the financial industry is also a good way to say orange jumpsuit is your favorite color. Um, <clears throat> I am a suit. It's uh, kind of terrifying. The reality is that being a suit is an interesting place to be. No one would think it would be interesting, though, uh, certainly not from a perspective outside the suit. Uh, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, uh, I used to uh, do this thing with scissors and glass slides. We called it multi-image. Um, if you think way, way back, way, way back, um, this was when photographs were on plastic film. This is something that most kids today are completely unfamiliar with. We also had circular audio recording mechanisms that did not use lasers. In this way, they were substantially less cool than the current methods. Um, <clears throat> I also had dreams. Uh, once upon a time, I, I dreamt that I would actually get a vacation on the moon, my food in pill format, uh, and there would be some sort of jetpack assistive device to get me to work. Uh, and I also used to get into a lot of trouble um, hanging out in bars and drinking to extreme ends. Fridays and Saturday nights ended when the ugly lights turned on at the bar. And, and now I'm, frankly, I'm one of them. Uh, it, it works out in my favor, though, because uh, unsurprisingly, being a senior officer in a corporation uh, pays relatively well. Uh, it certainly pays better than pizza delivery, and it pays better than I live in my mom's basement. Uh, this is a plus in, in almost every single way. And I'll tell you a whole bunch of reasons why, and I'll tell you how I got here. Uh, <clears throat> the the interesting stuff starts almost from the very beginning. When you start out self-identifying as a hacker, and I bet you more than two or three people in this room do self-identify as hackers, uh, you realize that you're never going to fit in. And it used to be, uh, back in the 80s when I started hacking, uh, never going to fit in means you're intimately familiar with the sensation of someone's shoe hitting your crotch. Uh, <clears throat> this is not the best way to, to become familiar with that sensation, by the way. Uh, there are sites on the internet for that. Uh, I spend a lot of time talking to people who are trying to figure out the security industry and what the security industry is all about. And part of the discussion always turns into, well, what do you want to be? What, what do you want to do? What, what is your contribution going to be? And, and you know, this is like that, that classic, um, what do you want to be when you grow up, guidance counselor kind of stuff. Uh, it works out kind of positively in some ways. Uh, most people say, I want a job. And, and I say, OK. Um, the kind of job where you only work 40 hours a week uh, is the kind of job where you're going to be in that position for the rest of your life. 
And sandwich artist is not a position you want to have when you're explaining to your grandkids what you do for a living. Um, any real job these days, you minimum, minimum barking figure, uh, presuming you can still walk to work, is you're putting in 60 hours. I choose to count my commute time as working hours because it's time that I'm spending doing things that are not interesting to me. Uh, and 60 hours is sort of the, you're just starting out. Uh, consider that amount of time. That's more time than you'll actually spend sleeping. And that's, you know, sleeping is much more interesting than work, at least for most people. Um, the reality is if you have a real job, you're working 80 plus hours a week. And what comprises real job is kind of like, like what comprises salary. Salary isn't the money that shows up in your bank account every two weeks. Salary is made up of a whole bunch of different components that include things like, um, do I have to dress like the rest of you? Uh, salary is composed of things like, you put your office where? Salary is composed of things like, what do you mean only two weeks vacation? Uh, if you know anybody who's from Europe, they laugh and fall over when we talk about two weeks vacation as being normal. Uh, six weeks plus is normal. Uh, two weeks is not enough time to recharge. Two weeks is what you use up on sick days when your kids are sick and Christmas. What's left over for your summer vacation is usually a couple of days and you never get that downtime you need to recharge and, and fill the batteries back up again. Um, the downside of security industry, of course, is that it comes with a bunch of negative things. And these negative things happen whether you are a participant in the security industry, so you're a consultant or you work for a vendor, or whether you are a user of security industry things, meaning you work in a corporation that builds widgets or loans people money. Um, and it, it's a different place to be in, depending on which side of it you're standing on. Uh, the other end part is eventually all of the risks and all those probabilities associated with risk, the probability clouds collapse into a single point, uh, which unfortunately is a very sharp point. It's usually located directly above your head. And that means that you spend a lot of time trying to make up for other people's issues. Um, if you can handle 80 hour weeks and being on call for the rest of the hours and doing mind-numbingly horrible things for the first few years as you pay your dues, you're probably in a position where corporate infosec or security industry is, is going to be in your future. Um, you are gonna be stuck, though, because there's a number of bad, si uh, uh, bad sides of this. Because it's interrupt-driven, uh, if you'd like that, you know, adrenaline junkies, please apply, um, you're going to be stuck with problems. And I wanna tell you a really funny story about finding 30 hours of work um, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, or at a previous employer, um, I once underwent an experiment. I wanted to find out what my real contribution to the organization was. And so for a period of one week, I attended all meetings that I was scheduled to attend, but otherwise, I spent a lot of time hitting refresh on Slashdot, and at that point I was using blog lines, RSS reader, uh, for a whole week. Nothing bad happened. So either I was really good at my job in that I'd fixed things so that nothing bad would ever happen, or my coworkers were picking up a lot of slack and were actually getting really pissed off at me. Uh, if you fast forward a couple of years, had a conversation with one of my coworkers at the time, Dave Lewis, and he said that he was doing it the same week. We compared notes. So the two of us were each not doing each other's job for a week, and that was great. Um, but when you compare that to some other weeks we had where we would get into the office when it was summertime and still dark and leave the office when it was summertime and dark, uh, you know, that's, if you're from this part of the country, you understand in the winter you're going to do that every day anyways. In the summer, if you're doing that, you're working too damn hard. Um, and we still didn't manage to get everything done. Uh, there's going to be a bunch of really scut jobs. Um, these are some of my favorite things that I spend even today doing all four of those things. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter where you are in the scale. You're going to be doing things like that. If, if you don't love typing stuff into Word, you need to learn to love it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, I've gotten to the point now where I've got a, a complete system worked out. I can type everything into Pico. Pico fans? 
we're, we're, we're the ones who stand out from the Vive versus Emacs debate, um, then paste it into Word and fix all the formatting, uh, or have someone else do it for you, which is even better. Uh, text files are your friend. Um, the other downside of all of this is you need to keep scrambling. Um, does everybody know how uh, army ants get from one side of a river to the other? Has anybody seen the video of this? So army ants are, are vicious. You could, you could literally dynamite bridges and they will still get across rivers. And the way they do it is they form this ball and they just keep climbing. So the ball looks like convection currents where the army ants are climbing up on top of each other. All the army ants on the bottom, of course, drown, but the army ants that were successful in climbing managed to get to the other side of the river and survive. Um, as it turns out, this is what you've got to do in the corporate world. You have to stomp on other people in order to survive. Uh, you have to be sort of prepared for that. Uh, you also have to have ethics. You will be asked to do something that you do not agree with. And you need to decide what your threshold is for I do not agree with that. Uh, one time working a consulting job, um, doing pen testing, and the CIO wanted a section of the report just, you know, to fall off the side of the, just, just hit delete, it'll be okay. And uh, that was the section of the report that proved that he hadn't been doing his job for about three years. And I decided that it, it was really down to, do I delete this chunk of the report and try and walk away, you know, at least notionally clean, or do I leave it in and have this guy lose his job? And I chose the third option because, well, when I was very young, I wanted to grow up to be Kirk. And I said, you know what? I don't, the company I was working for, I was senior enough that I could say, we don't need the money. We're walking away. So we walked away, pen test done to the point where the report was ready to deliver, and we just literally walked away and said, we're firing the client, we're done. Um, you've gotta be able to make that decision at a personal level. You've gotta be aware that you're going to, at some point, issue a report or a recommendation or a statement that is going to cause 100 people to lose their jobs. And you, know, you can think about what the personal impact of losing your job would be. Uh, if you're like me and you're a family person, it affects not just you, but the three people who are standing behind you. Uh, and you've gotta be aware that at some point, you're going to you know, level the laser finger of death and 100 people and everybody who's dependent upon them is gonna be suddenly looking for something to do. And I just sidestep that by having a very small process that runs weekly that just evaluates whether or not I've survived the week. Uh, you can try that, it doesn't always work. So how many people, not that I can see hands because these lights are like freaking lasers. Um, <clears throat> how many people have a job where security is only part of it, but they'd like it to be all about security? Hmm? Um, no, my job's pretty much all about security, so, yeah. Um, we'll talk, though, I think you've got the, a point that I'll make later on, but, you know, you're the kind of person who spends some time unglitching print queues and some time, you know, fixing firewalls. So you've got one of those in-between jobs. Uh, if you're not at step one, that's terrific. We can skip through to step two. Um, getting that first all security job, though, is often quite difficult. Uh, if you're not lucky enough to land in it, uh, most people get into the security industry by accident. Uh, remember I said I was an artist for a while, then I was an accountant for a while, and then I landed in the security industry. Uh, and that happens usually for most people. Um, getting that first job is hard. I'm working through this with a couple of people on a mentoring basis right now, and you've gotta get your stuff together. It, it comes down to just that simple. You've gotta, you've gotta do the, the work part of it. it. It's hard to get the last point through really clearly. If you feel that you need to aggrandize your, your capabilities or make yourself look better, um, you will get caught. I know because I interview a lot of people and I always catch. Um, at this point, you're, you're doing all the things that you're supposed to be doing. Um, that first job uh, includes a whole lot of things like log review and metrics. And we're all sorry for that, but I can't make decisions with nothing. Somebody's gotta do the log review and metrics. Uh, and if you do a good job, you'll get noticed and you'll be able to skip to step two faster. It also, unfortunately, means that you're gonna have to do it the SANS way. Um, I have a currently semi-personal hate on for SANS, so bear with me as I get through that uh, 
it's a, it's a personal growth opportunity. That's how I choose to see it. Um, but it means that state of the art is six years ago, and you're going to have to just try and keep up with it. Um, I, I can't make the point more clearly about getting involved, though. This is your opportunity to have other parts of the organization see you as a value and not as a hindrance. So even though you're at the bottom of the tier, and even though you might be working uh, in a security group or security department that is not forthcoming with doing things in a way that is user-centric, um, you're still going to be there. This is also your opportunity to be a generalist. Uh, I've had more than one occasion to be sitting in a meeting with people who are experts in more than just Windows and servers and server hardware, uh, ILO cards and stuff like that, SANS, uh, AIX, uh, a whole bunch of variations on the desktop platform sets, uh, a couple of odd Unixes, Tandem. You're all sitting in the room with them and you're saying, this is the way you've got to do security going forward. And they say, but you don't know anything about our platform. And I'm like, so try your best bullshit test on me. And you've got to be that level of generalist. You've got to be able to understand from their perspective what their pain points are. So when you're in that step one job, when it's your first real security job, that's a chance to start to pick that stuff up. If you're doing log review, you're going to learn a lot about how the internals of that operating system work. It's a great opportunity to do that learning, and you should do it. Um, you also shouldn't be afraid to quit. Um, the trick, though, is that you've got to stay at least one year. Uh, if you're working consecutive six-week contracts, they better actually be contracts and not, I got frustrated and left. Uh, because again, people will find out. Um, and you've got to spread yourself around. At, a, at the very least, you've got to work in an organization where you're just a number, in an organization where everybody knows your name, and in an organization where everybody hates you, especially taxpayers. And you've got to spend a lot of time on this non-technical stuff, uh, to put it most politely. Um, you're on a path, and we'll, we'll go into more detail on this, but you're on a path where you have to be the go-to person. Uh, I would recommend that you go back and review there a series of documentaries that were done on PBS that talk about uh, how to get along with other people and likability. Uh, the, um, the main presenter is a, a very large anthropomorphized bird, has a frog friend. Uh, you, you might have seen this, this, these documentaries. It's very important to review them. Um, beware, though, they use a, a, an anti-pattern character, though. Uh, apparently, must be homeless, lives in a garbage can. Uh, work your way through those, and you'll find out that uh, all of those lessons still count, even though, fortunately or unfortunately, we've become adults, and we can't just sit on the couch and eat Cheerios. Uh, eventually, you'll get tapped for your first management job. Uh, it, it's usually under the guise of something called Team Leader, which stands for Junior Assistant Manager of. Um, if you're in the fast food industry, you actually get the title Junior Assistant Manager of. Uh, team Leader, I think, does have a certain professional ring to it. Um, the trick, though, is that the job of Team Leader, again, has nothing to do with technology. Um, it has everything to do with keeping the other parts of the organization off of your coworkers so they can get the work done. Um, that time that you spend running interference, though, is time that's taken away from your skills building. So this is where you've got to come to grips with the fact that skills building isn't, for the rest of your life, going to mean it's blinky and it's shiny and it has a user interface. Uh, it means that uh, you're going to have to interface with users. Um, I should have been clicking through those slides. Um, the, the, the giving up on the hacking machines is hard. And unfortunately, for a brief period of time, you're going to have to give that up. Uh, there's a whole subsection of things from around 2001 to 2004 that I have no grip whatsoever on. Um, so there's a whole section of how to pen test things and how to attack things and how computers work from that period of time that I have no grip on whatsoever. Um, however, during that time, I did learn how to cause large, um, they would be, uh, they're, they're called Profit 50 in Canada, so they'd be like Fortune 1000 companies uh, in, in terms of the North American perspective. Um, I know how to make them work and do what I want them to do. So I think that's a reasonable trade, um, a, a trade that was worth it. The downside is that that means that I've had to spend a lot of time doing things that are less interesting. Um, HR reports, are not interesting. 
I, 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 I love having indirect reports, people that I can tell to do things and they have to do them, compared to direct reports, which are people that I can tell things and they have to do them, and if they get sick, I have to pat their fuzzy little heads and tell them it'll all get better. Um, again, opportunities for personal growth. Everybody should have one of those lists. Uh, you're also gonna have to begin to learn about um, horrible words like budget and financing, um, because you have to finance your own operation and you have to get along. The getting along is hard, really hard. Um, the trick though is that you're again expanding that circle of, of organizational units that you have contact with. So you're not just you know security help desk, you're not just you know enterprise security operations center, can I help you? Uh, you're not just the poor person who's sitting looking at, uh, because most companies are really anal about this stuff, a terrible interface for log reading uh, to the point where grep would be an improvement. Um, but that's sort of the life that you're stuck with. Um, the trick though is people begin to know you as someone who just knows their crap. So everybody in security has got a million things on the tip of their brain, right? You know, you can point at anybody in the audience and say, so um, what's the best way for me to exploit MSO 902? Half the audience is like, oh, well, you know, and launches into an hour-long dissertation on the problem. Um, you've got to be that way with a whole bunch of other stuff, and, and that can be a bit of a push. Um, but you know the different parts of the organization. And best of all, if you shift organizations, you'll discover that other people have shifted along with you. You'll keep running into the same very small group of people. Uh, in the context that we're in right now, I've seen more than half of you at another security conference, right? You've seen me too, haven't you, right? Um, but those people that'll travel along with you through organizations in the city or town that you work in, um, you'll also recognize archetypical people. There's Edna, she works in HR. She wears jogging shoes when she's not at her desk but wears high heels when she's at her desk. You know her and you know everything about what that archetypical person does and how they fit into the organization and how to make that person do what you want them to do. Uh, eventually though, you're gonna have to work with executives and unfortunately, that means that you've got to change a whole bunch of things about how you talk to individuals. Um, the, the talking to them becomes the hard part, it really does. You have to change the whole nature of your language. Uh, the, the first point um, is that if you like to use $75 words because it's the most precise way to express the issue at hand, you can stop that now. Um, I got into a vicious argument over whether proscribed or prescribed was the correct word. I meant proscribed. I said proscribed. You've never seen the word proscribed? I'm terribly sorry for you. You should pick up a copy of Reader's Digest. It has a beautiful feature every month to increase your word power. Um, <clears throat> the trick though is you're at a point where the money's starting to look really interesting, okay? This, this is where you're either just within the grasp of six figures, although that doesn't mean what it used to, um, or you're, you're just, just above six figures. And there's that, that lovely sensation like, ooh, I'm a, never gonna be a millionaire. <laughs> um, but going back to the, the speaking their language thing for a minute, um, we all talk about things that are probabilistic risks, right? Probabilistic threats. You know, what are the chances that somebody is actually going to violate your Windows machine when you put it on the internet to get that first 290 million byte download of crap from Microsoft? Well, probably you are gonna get attacked, but maybe not. And the kinds of people that you're dealing with now, they understand risk. They make risk-based decisions all the time. They just don't use that kind of language. Um, they're not accustomed to talking to other people about those sorts of risks. So you've got to change how you express yourself. So you start living in a world of analogies. Everything is an object lesson. Uh, and it's fortunate and unfortunate simultaneously, but it means that you've got a whole bunch of back pocket ones. And, and I'm gonna gift you with the best back pocket one. 
Um, if you go through any of the religious training programs, um, ISC2 or ISACA or SANS, um, you will have been told that the biggest risks to an organization are the legislative risk, the regulatory risk, and the reputational risk. And if you go and try and explain that to an executive and say, I'm really concerned about our legislative, regulatory, and reputational risks, the executive is going to look at you like you've got 11 heads, dismiss you as irrelevant, and go play golf. You can express it in a completely different way that says the same thing, but has an awful lot more punch. You could say, sir or ma'am, I'm concerned about three things, and there's three things that I want to do for you. I want to protect you from orange jumpsuits, from losing your house, and most of the time from looking stupid. What I need budget for is to make sure that you never wore an orange jumpsuit, that you never lose your house, and we'll negotiate how stupid we're willing to look together. Done, they understand. Of course they don't want to wear an orange jumpsuit. Most people look horrible in orange. <laughs> they don't want to lose their house because explaining that to the spouse, not easy, not easy at all. Honey, um, we can't afford a storage unit and we have to move. Not a phone call anybody wants to have. Um, and looking stupid is something that executives are accustomed to. Um, not that every executive you meet is like me, stuck in, in the parenting world, but in the parenting world, you look stupid all the time, right? I, I don't know how many of you have kids, but when you're out in public with your kids, you're like one of, the, one of the gang, right? You're perfectly willing to look stupid and do dumb stuff. Executives are willing to do that at a certain level as well, in a business sense. They're willing to say, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have this brilliant idea, and I'm gonna lay the line down in the sand, and I'm gonna say, we're going to have open podless offices. You know, this has been done before. Big ad firm did it, sort of lost their contract with their main, um, with their main supplier. But you, know, you, can, you can make those sorts of things that are potentially very foolhardy. And they know how to weigh the risks when they're gonna make those decisions. You've just gotta help them talk that way. Um, this is also a good time to go back and, and look at your education. Uh, if you don't know the difference between a debit and a credit, you need to know the difference between a debit and a credit. And the way that it looks on your bank statement, not the way that you need it for your day-to-day -day job, by the way. That's the little accounting hint there. And because I went through the hell of T accounts, you all should too. Uh, but take some business courses. Um, most schools have um, the equivalent of an, I'm going to audit the MBA course because I'm not actually qualified to take an MBA. Um, They've got nighttime courses, they've got weekend courses that can help you understand some of this stuff, that can help you understand labor relations, that can help you understand economics. Uh, because if you came into this the way that I did, you came up through being the kind of person who thinks outside the box and does crazy ass things that turn out to be very cool in the end, uh, you're an artistic temperament, you don't have that background in cold, boring things like economics and why it makes more sense for you to take option A than option B, and here's the proof. Um, there's some downsides to taking business courses. Uh, the people that you're taking business courses with generally aren't going to get your sense of humor. Uh, so mostly sit near the back of the class and stay very quiet. Um, the other thing is that you've got to start changing your image. If you haven't started changing your image on your path through, uh, through Team Leader, um, there's a whole bunch of downsides to this. Um, the, the major downside is eventually you've got to put the suit on. Uh, business suit for women, uh, which I've heard is a much more uncomfortable garment set than the comes with a noose business suit for men. Uh, but uh, it includes a whole bunch of very important things. I'm going to tell you that you can't wear the joke shirt as an undershirt uh, because it shows through. I'm not going to tell you why I know that. Um, <laughs> The other part of it is there's different ways to choose to appear to be knowledgeable. Um, you know that the number one method to appear to be knowledgeable is to wear a tweed jacket with the leather arm patches. Uh, there are other ways to appear to be knowledgeable, and one of those is to look like you know your shit cold. Now, if you actually know your shit cold, but you dress like you live in your mom's basement, no one is going to take you as a believable source of information. But if you know your shit cold and dress like you know your shit cold, people will be lining up at your door. And I mean that quite literally, lining up at your door for advice. Um, 
the other part of it is, of course, that you're in a place that you've never really been in before. Um, giving this talk at, at a con is kind of funny because we all sort of fit in, right? I mean, it's the only place where you can really fit in, um, wear your heart on your sleeve. Actually, there's a person walking around with a heart. It beats on their sleeve. Um, <clears throat> the downside of that is when you're not at awesome places like Nauticon, uh, you can't do any of those things. So the, the bizarre stuff that makes you happy um, is things that you leave at home and you do your best to fit in. If they find you, uh, they will flush you out of the tribe so fast. It, it's freakish. Hello, computer. Um, this is the time where you can pause. Uh, you, you've, you've gotten to the point where, as long as you're at an, an executive integration level, so where you're regularly speaking to people who have chief as part of their title, um, and they're not people who pump gas, those people also often have the title, hey chief, um, you're in a position where you can start to do cool stuff. Um, when you're making uh, 100 bucks an hour, a $50 RFID kit is very cool. This is also an opportunity to adopt early. Um, I bought an EPC 701 very, very shortly after they came out. So because I bought the crappy low resolution seven inch screens, all of you have the really nice nine inch, 10 inch resolution that actually works because 800 by 480 doesn't work for anything. I actually gave that machine to my son. He recently um, had an accident. Uh, you can get bologna and chocolate milk vomit out of an EPC 701. It takes a little while. Um, the other thing that, that starts to happen is you start to have budgets for things and uh, the company can start to pick up that tab, which is good. Um, you should spend some time just being. This is sort of a, a pause to catch your breath before you jump the next step on the ladder. Um, you've also got to be aware of people who are going to try and trip you at this point. Um, most large corporations are an exact mirror of high school. Uh, what's interesting is, and I'm, I've only heard this, I haven't recently been back to high school, but uh, apparently nerds are on the rise. Um, uh, people are using these computer things to communicate with each other, and that's turned into a great opportunity for, for us. The downside is that all of those things that you remember from high school, they're doing them and worse in work. Uh, at the most senior levels of publicly traded corporations, you will find passive aggression, the likes of which even my mom does not execute on me. you will be treated like a dork. Um, somebody, somebody, uh, usually somebody who got a touchdown or a basket, these are apparently sports terms, um, one of those individuals will find you and decide to treat you the way that all nerds should be treated. Again, there's, there's a documentary available. Um, it took place back in the 80s uh, about guys that spent a lot of time having their underwear yanked up over their heads. Um, You'll also experience something called matrix management. Uh, if you haven't experienced this, it's outlined well in the uh, documentary office space, uh, you've got more than one boss. And you get accustomed to having more than one boss pretty much all of the time. Uh, this can work to your favor in that you can play your bosses against each other, which is a very awesome, awesome game. Uh, don't ever let them find out that it's an awesome game. They will take that game away from you. Um, if you find yourself really fitting in, um, it's just not good. <laughs> this is also, as part of that pause time, time to maintain those contacts, maintain that networking. Uh, it's very important because, generally speaking, the industries are very small. Um, I'm from, well, I don't live in Toronto, but I work in Toronto, spend a lot of my time in Toronto, Ontario, which has a very, very small, very incestuous security community. Everybody knows everybody. And that means that at some point, you will find yourself working for someone who used to work for you. You will find yourself needing to sell something to someone that you once really pissed off, or you're not gonna make your quota and you're not gonna get paid. You may find yourself in a position where you get to not buy someone Either you don't hire them or you don't purchase the product that they're, sh that they're selling. 
uh, because they ticked you off in the past. Um, these are all great opportunities, again, sometimes for personal growth, but times where you need to maintain that network and find out where people are shifting to. Uh, because as those shifts happen, you start to find interesting possibilities, especially possibilities for your future. Um, the, the downside um, is that there's also these professional associations. Uh, some of them are great. Um, sometimes you'll find a group of people who do what you do and you can get together and talk about stuff. Uh, that doesn't happen a lot in the security industry in a geographic confined area uh, because you generally can't talk to your competitors about how you do security. Um, so you'll find that for the most part, the professional organizations that you're involved with tend to be quite large. Um, opportunities to uh, shoot the shit and say, how did you approach that situation are going to happen at large conventions like next week's RSA or Black Hat. Um, there's certainly people who have come to Nauticon that I've uh, either talked to or want to talk to about specific problems and how they approached them. Um, but the local ones, it's sometimes an issue. Uh, and to a greater or lesser extent, um, you can use the, the beard hair analogy for this one. You guys know about the beard hair thing? If you go into a professional group and there's more beard hair happening than you're comfortable with, there's sort of a threshold. If it's every other person, it's okay, but if it's only one person who remembered to shave, generally you're looking at a bunch of people who aren't working in the industry and or um, ex-BBS and CB radio fanatics. They like to think they're in the security industry, but they're really at the edge periphery of updating people's antivirus for them at their houses. Hmm? Uh, yes, but never piss off a Unix sysadmin. <laughs> 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 there's, there's a, uh, those are some of the most difficult people in the world to get along with. Uh, they seem to be at war with the DBAs. Don't piss off either of them. That is a great opportunity to make friends and influence people through the judicious application of alcohol and or fetishes. Um, <clears throat> spend a whole lot of time helping out people that are at step one. And this sounds altruistic and socialist and use whatever other kinds of ists you want to add in there, but it's very important because at some point you were a step one, you were trying to get that first security job and either somebody helped you or nobody helped you. And in either one of those cases, you owe it to karma and the universe to unglitch that. Uh, and this will come back and pay you off later. Um, because if nothing else, you may find yourself at a point where you need to ask someone that you could have mentored for work. And that person will say, I needed you and you didn't need me. Screw you. And that happens, that odd upside down thing happens way more often than you think it could. Um, because to a greater or lesser extent, the security industry is actually pragmatically built upon capability, um, not on your simple ability to outlive, uh, compared to other industries where seniority just comes from age. Uh, in the security industry, seniority comes from skill. And it's very odd and we need to make sure that we don't lose that. Um, you will eventually arrive. Um, for some people, this happens very quickly. Other people, it happens more slowly. Uh, it depends on what your personal arc is. Um, my arc was fairly sharp. Uh, it took me less than 15 years to go from an accountant to a CISO. Um, it may take you shorter, it may take you longer. Uh, it may be how you define CISO. For me, it was publicly traded uh, financial institution. As long as I was the one in charge of security at that, that was my I've arrived. Um, I expected it would happen when I was 40, it happened when I was 34. So it could happen to almost anybody. Um, the upsides are really awesome. Uh, the most awesome upside is you'll discover this thing called compensation negotiation, where it no longer matters what band you fit in or what the person who used to have the job got paid. Uh, you can figure out what you want to be paid and you can start to play off those I'd rather only come into the office four days a week, not five, and I'll let you save some money that way. Or you can say things like, I'm going to be going to Black Hat and DEF CON this summer, and it costs about $5,000. Either you can send to me, or you can give me $10,000, and I'll pay after tax. It's up to you. Uh, most organizations um, do understand debits and credits, and they will do the right thing there. Um, 
in most organizations, you're in a position where the CISO is not well articulated. I was the first CISO for a mid, mid market sized bank. Um, so every CISO after me will be compared to me. Um, but it's a great opportunity to step in and really realign organizations, pull them out of blinky lights and shiny things and help them understand that until they fix their users, um, they're not going to be able to fix their problems. Um, now I'm gonna give you some new content. Uh, this stuff is really important as it's starting to happen right now. I got like a hair or something on my tongue, it's disgusting. Um, <clears throat> so you know about these two characters and what they've done to the world. <laughs> and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't fault anybody for being a little bit worried about what's going on. Um, things to remember, we know exactly why and how this one happened. Um, which makes it easier to undo. Uh, everybody who's done forensics work knows this. As long as you can figure out how it happened, you can undo it. Um, but we're in a very unique time. It's not as bad now as it was when I was looking for my first job out of college. It's not as bad now as it was when my dad bought our first big house and had a mortgage at 17.5%. That's like credit card interest on a mortgage on a house. So you know it's not that bad, right? Um, this is my latest inspiration. Uh, everybody should have a copy of this. Um, this is the Bray Shield for the Special Air Service of the uh, UK military. Um, who dares wins. Uh, it, gets, it gets banged up in a bunch of different forms. Uh, it was misquoted in a movie. Um, but it comes down to, very simply, you need to take a risk. And I, I understand that taking risks is very, very hard, um, especially personal level risks. You know, you, you don't wanna give up what you've got. Uh, but sometimes taking that giant leap is the only way to survive. And it's so simple, it's agonizingly painful. You've got a job, try applying for another one. Um, because really, you might just get the job. Um, I'm pulling this example from a talk that I did in Toronto where I was suggesting that people should do things in a different way, be a little less dependent upon the standard and a little more interested in doing cool stuff. And people said, but I, I can't do that. And, and the example plays out really easily. Um, anybody in an organization that uses web, outbound web filtering, you can't go and visit that site because it might have hackers yeah, you know those things don't work, right? Yeah, you know how expensive WebSense is for a corporation that has 1,000 users? It, it is not cheap. Um, it is really, really effective, though, when you're doing the come to the woodshed security awareness talk to say to somebody, when you're at work, I'm helping you to understand this because your first job, when you're at work, not at school, not at home, but when you're at work, I want you to imagine all of the time that your grandmother is standing right behind you. And at any point, you should be able to explain what you're doing on the internet. If you're not comfortable explaining it to your grandmother in excruciating detail, you probably shouldn't be doing it at work. So would you like to explain what you're doing at hotmoms.com to, to your grandmother? Most people, not so much. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> <clears throat> There's one in every freaking audience. There's one in every audience. Um, yeah, but not actually that hot. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a, a great time to take those, those crazy risks and, and do good stuff. Um, if you've got a job and you're comfortable and you don't feel like taking the terrifying risk of applying for a better job, um, by the way, there's lots of jobs available. Uh, the issue that we're having is not just the, the problem of sheer unemployment, it's that we don't have the right people for the jobs. Um, I know of more than six director level positions, so these are positions that are well in excess of six figures, that are currently sitting open. I know of five unfilled CISO jobs. Um, these are jobs that make almost 200 grand a year because there aren't people to fill them. So that unemployment figure that's scaring you to death on CNN or Fox News, that unemployment figure is people who can't get a job because they're unwilling to do something. 
uh, you know, you, you ever find yourself really truly unemployed and you refuse to take the job at McDonald's or digging ditches, you deserve to be unemployed. Um, if you're not skilled enough to take a job, the job sits empty and shows as an unfilled position. Uh, they don't do as good a job tracking the demographic matches for that, but there's probably a job that is one step up from your current seniority level that's sitting empty waiting for somebody smart enough to take it. Um, so now's a good time to do that. Um, spend some good time working on Me Inc. Uh, how many people expect at this point that they're going to spend the rest of their working career with the company that they're at? Exactly. Um, go back even one generation and the entire room would have their hands up. Whatever company hired you out of university or college or high school gave you a pension, you worked there for 35 years, they gave you a gold watch and you walked away. That was your working life. Um, I don't think any of us have that expectation. Um, I'm on career number four or five, depending on how you count it, um, in my mid to late 30s. And I expect that I'll be working for the next 40 to 50 years. Um, I don't think that it's gonna end at 65. Uh, I'd love that it would, I'd love to be partially retired, but I also know that I'm gonna be working a long time. And Me Inc. is the only company I really care about. Um, Organizations have proven that they don't have loyalty to you. Um, people can purchase my loyalty for a certain period of time and at a set price. Um, I'm sure most of you are the same way. We follow the mercenary code. Um, I will work for you, I will follow your rules, I will drink your Kool-Aid, I will rah-rah at the company events uh, until you stop paying me, in which case I'm gonna move on to other cool stuff. Um, this is a great time to catch up on education. Education is expensive. Uh, there are other ways to educate. Um, one of my most interesting time periods in my life was when I was working as a consultant and I was keeping ahead in the same way that all of my high school teachers did. They were one lesson plan ahead of the class. I was one chapter in the manual ahead of the client. Um, it's, it, it's a skill that you need to learn. Uh, if you don't know a topic today, you'll know it tomorrow. Uh, and it's a skill that most hackerish people have but they don't apply to their working lives. Uh, have you ever come across a problem and you've researched it until you were an expert? You've done it in a very, very short period of time, um, not because you had to, but because you wanted to. All the heads should be nodding. You've all done this, right? Something caught your interest and two and a half weeks later you came up for air, found out that you hadn't showered in two and a half weeks, but you know everything there is to know about that topic. We're all that intrinsically built that way, and you can teach yourself just as effectively. You can look up something called the Personal MBA Project, which is the reading list for an executive MBA program. Do you need somebody to stand in front of you and say, read chapters 11 through 13 in this book, and then come back next week and we'll talk about it? Or can you just pick up the book and read it? And most of you read at rates that would shock university people, so pick up the list read all of the books. The first few aren't gonna make any sense at all, but eventually the connections will start to happen. This is a great time to do that. You can also do the, um, I'm going to take a course at a university library method. Um, if you don't live near a university library, pick a really big public library. Uh, close your eyes, walk around, stop, turn, reach your arm out, grab a book. That's your new topic for study. Know it, learn it inside out, backwards, upside down. Um, and spend some time doing the networking stuff. Spend some time doing pro bono work. Um, I, I've come across a situation recently where uh, there's a charity that needs help. Um, they're running computer systems. They happen to also have some health information. They're not doing a very good job of managing either of them. I can help. Does it cost me a whole lot out of my life? Six or eight hours a week. But is it making a, a complete difference in that organization? Yes, because they've never had access to somebody like me and they certainly couldn't afford to hire me. Um, that's a time for you to step in and help out with that kind of stuff. Um, the other part that is really key and really, really important is that information security is all about control. Vendors will argue this and tell you that it's all about compliancy or cyber something or other, um, but the control is the important part. When money or credit gets tight, organizations look to control. And information security folks can really help out. 
you can find inefficiencies just by looking at gross systems. Because in most organizations, it's only the InfoSec people that have the gestalt of the organization, where they understand all of the moving parts. Um, organizations tend to be very siloed, and most people only have to know their silo. Um, this happens in the IT group, this happens in the business groups, it doesn't matter where you look. Um, operations has no idea how their IT stuff interfaces with them. One part of the IT department doesn't talk to the rest of the IT department. Um, you're in a place where you can help to increase control. Um, the other thing that you can help out with is reputational risk, and that's the basis for credit. It's, is your reputation that you will pay, or is your reputation that you continue to build cars that no one buys? Um, you're in a position where you can help to fix that. And very importantly, and I know there's some people in the audience who work in the security vendor industry, and there are some people in the audience who work for organizations that utilize security products and services, um, the reductions are gonna happen in the sales forces and in the support forces for security product companies. So when you see that writing on the wall, and the writing on the wall is gonna be really obvious after next week, um, RSA is big spend time, and RSA this year is gonna look a whole lot different than it did two years ago. Um, you're not gonna see that same shrink in organizations that use information security, uh, because they've got legal and regulatory and reputational compliance issues to worry about. Um, <clears throat> but I don't wanna go any further into the security industry stuff. Uh, there's a whole nother talk about that, uh, which I'll give you if you really, really, really wanna hear it. It gets really, really, really ranty in the middle. Any questions? And remember, I can't see any of you, so you're just gonna have to, that side, somebody speak up. Um, you, you oh, here comes a microphone. You mentioned during your career getting to the point of, of being team lead and then you jumped up to CISO. Yeah. A lot of other areas you would expect to have a lot of management positions before getting from one of those to the other. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in InfoSec have kind of jumped quickly. I just wanted, what are your thoughts there? What typically do you think steps in between should be? Or how do, I guess how do you make that jump from first management to it, CISO? It's that executive interaction position. It's that you're the, the manager of compliance or you're the manager of uh, perimeter protection services, where you're, where you're at a point where you're a direct report of a CISO or a CISO-like position, uh, and you're regularly speaking to other parts of the organization about initiatives and about uh, things that are happening. So those management middle layer jobs, and it depends on the size of the organization and how many layers of management they have. Um, they're generally called uh, either manager or director positions. Um, that's where you're gonna be able to pick up that kind of stuff, and that's where you're making friends and influencing people is, is happening. You find it's easier to make that move inside an organization or jumping to a new one? Uh, it's probably easier in both cases than most people think. Uh, if I had to pick, I'd choose to do it jumping from organization to organization. I'd try not to grow within an organization, uh, but that's my personal preference, not to stay anywhere too long. Uh, I don't want moss growing on me. Um, so really, you can do it either way. It, it, the thing to be careful of, though, is don't make yourself sound better than you actually are capable of pulling off. Or make, your sound, make yourself sound slightly better than you're actually capable of pulling off, so you've got a bit of a reach target. Uh, but that's probably the best way to handle it. Anybody else? Speak up, because literally, it's so strange. You guys need a view of this. I cannot see faces. Questions? Yes, no, going once. Oh, we got one. You mentioned that you had taken off that one week and did nothing. Yeah. How long did it catch you, take you to catch up in the following week or weeks? Or I, didn't it make any difference? It didn't make any difference. Um, that, I should point out, that's because I'm an intrinsically lazy person. Uh, intrinsically lazy sounds bad, but it actually works out to be really well. In most organizations, um, people like to turn hand cranks. They like to keep doing the same manual process. You know, if, if they could arrange the situation such that they always had to come in on Thursday afternoons to pick up a form from one box and put it in another box, they would. Um, because I'm intrinsically lazy, I'm willing to spend two weeks worth of hard effort to ensure that I never have to spend an hour a week ever again. 
Um, so when I design processes and when I design procedures, I design out all of those manual um, paper pushing or hand cranking kinds of steps uh, so that they don't have to happen. And that enables me to do things like keep up on my RSS feeds. Does that make sense? I, I understand the catching up problem. Uh, that happens when you take holidays and you come back and your inbox has got 350 things in it. Um, if you're smart, when you've left, this is, again, lazy, um, you put in your out of office um, notification, I will not respond to emails sent to me during this period. If you need to discuss something with me, please set up a meeting, either with yourself or with both of us, for when I get back, and we'll deal with it then. And then when you get back, you hit click on the top one, shift click on the bottom one, hit the delete key, and you're good. Uh, if it was actually important, people will resend the email or you'll get yelled at by your boss. Um, I choose not to process those email boxes when I get back. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, yep. So over here. Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, what, are, what are some other social engineer type tricks like that? I, just hearing that made me totally change my question. What, what are some other social engineer type things that we can do to um, All right. uh, get away I, from I, the one-two step? I shall continue to give away all of my best stuff. Um, here, here's, a, here's a great one. Uh, ever, anybody use uh, whole disk encryption? Anybody know the fundamental flaw in whole disk encryption? Uh, it only kicks in when you hibernate the machine or turn it off. Uh, so in an organization where you know, we're implementing whole disk encryption, PGP, FTW, um, the issue that we had was that people were in the habit of walking away from their, walking away from their computers because we'd set the screensaver time low and machines would eventually go into suspend and, and it was all good, but the machine wasn't locking up. And so, you know, because I'm lazy, I'm willing to understand that there's probably more than one or two other lazy people out there. Um, I need to make the right way the easy way. So we made a very simple change. We pushed out a GPO that said, um, after a machine goes into screensaver, wait one minute and suspend, then wait five minutes and hibernate. And then when we were doing the user education training, we were talking about how whole disk encryption is going to affect their lives. We said, when you walk away from your laptop, close the lid. Because that causes suspend to kick in right away. And we know that within five minutes of them walking away, which is a risk adjudicated period long enough, we know those machines are going to go into hibernate mode and we know they're going to have to put in their pre-boot password to get the machine back up and running. So rather than giving them a 12-step procedure about how when you're locking your machine and you're walking away, you have to make sure to, it's just easier for them if we do a little bit of more work and give them a solution that doesn't require them to think about it at all. So I never had to explain to anybody, you've always got to shut your machine down to make sure that the pre-boot authentication works because otherwise the encryption stuff isn't encrypting anything. And I just, I was able to sidestep that entire conversation um, in a very, very easy step for me, you know, what's, an hour, what's half an hour, an hour's worth of administrator's time uh, on a Windows domain controller worth? Um, literally about $65. So that's a cheap solution rather than going to 1,000 employees or 1,500 employees and spending half an hour explaining to them how whole disk encryption works. Um, they just look at you like you're a complete nerd and walk away and say, yeah, whatever, dude, just I want to do the, the email and, and the interweb thing. So there's, there's all kinds of places where you can do those very, very slick. Um, they end up being um, either gratuitous or really awesome hacks, but they're very effective hacks because you've managed to make the security policy something that doesn't have to be enforced. It's auto-enforcing or self-enforcing. Does that make sense? And you just look for those opportunities. I spend a lot of time fishing for opportunities. Um, but when you're lazy and you don't have any other work to do, um, you can be very creative about that stuff. Um, most organizations, everybody is unaware that they're in a box. Um, for most hackers, the box is a dot. You're that far out of it. Um, spend some time leveraging that. It's worth money. Anyone else? Ah, I see a hand in the middle. That's helpful. I'm coming at this from, uh, I'm going to ask you to do something that you don't want to do as an information officer. Awesome. Okay. Um, I'm a, uh, I'm a salesman. Uh, various things, yep. and uh, basically it's a relationship engineering sales. Yes. The more access I have to your information, yep. yes, the more advantage I can take of you, but also the more advantage I have of being able to help you. 
uh, quid pro quo solutions selling, sell me what I need to buy rather than what you have to sell. Yeah. You're a salesperson I can get along with. Okay, now how do I, uh, how do I uh, go about essentially gaining your trust either technically or in, in some other way so that you're willing to open up your system to me? Um, it depends on what open up means. Um, if, if we've been working together for a period of time, I'll be willing to tell you things more often than not uh, if you just ask. Um, but you need to have a justification for why you're asking. So you need to lead the ball a little bit. Uh, and sometimes that will end up where you end up smacking yourself in the face. But tell me why you need it. Say, you know, in order to do a better job of configuring our response to your requirements, we need to have a more detailed understanding of your network number of devices intent, you know, essentially your intent for, for, this, for the sale. Um, if I'm actually interested in your product, probably I'll answer it. Um, but in order to get to that, you've got to do that trust building that you alluded to. And a lot of that is listen more than talk. Um, I find you know, just sitting back and listening can be terribly effective. Um, there are some vendors who understand me when I say, do not phone me. I'm in my 30s. I don't do synchronous interruptive communications. I only do asynchronous non-interruptive communications. Uh, my phone message actually says, if you're planning on leaving a voicemail, don't send me an email instead. Uh, if you get that as a vendor, I'll talk to you. Um, but if you get on the horn and you want to talk to me for half an hour and explain to me how cyber compliancy is really going to affect things and make sure that my future is better, I'm going to hang up the phone uh, because I usually don't even have the patience to say goodbye. Yeah, well, so that, that's the trust building is the listening. I was coming at this from a little different perspective. Oh, um, sure. You're a... Um, you're the information officer for a company that sells products. You're a distributor for a distribution company. Sure. I want to make me products for you to distribute. Yep. You have information on uh, what you think the market will bear, um, what problems you've found in the field, things of that nature. I want access to that information so that I can answer the, answer the problem before it starts. And that information is in your computer. Yep. So basically, it's a still the same answer when I will ask how to get to how to get to that access information um, on an on online regular regular basis without it in a human interface. Um, be willing to sign an NDA and be willing to have in place a contract that has some rather vigorous terms about what happens if you ever screw up. <laughs> and be aware that I will audit you regularly and I will require that you have regular audits done. So I want to see SAS 70 type 2s done by somebody competent. Um, the big four are not considered competent for these purposes uh, in order to make sure that uh, you're not going to completely screw me over by being uh, a chink in my armor. So it, it's not really hard, but I'm, I'm back to contract language and making sure the contract language has penalties that are cash inclusive. We've got one minute or zero minutes. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Anybody else? Uh, if you happen to see me, stop me, and we can talk about pretty much anything. Um, the more beer that's involved, the more I'll talk. Thanks very much for coming. I really appreciate you sitting through it. Have an awesome time.